Welcome back, Sebastian here. So time for my power rankings for the 2024 Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Pretty good Grand Prix last night. Uh, very close racing for the lead for the lead as well. Uh, and of course, that big dramatic crash at the end. And that crash definitely did have an impact on what I decided to do for my power rankings today. So we're starting number 20. Uh, a driver who I felt had a pretty poor weekend all around, qualifying pretty poor, and then uh, in the race had a incident towards the start and then ended up retiring from the Grand Prix uh, and that is none other than Lance Stroll. Uh, so for Stroll, pretty tough weekend, out qualified by Alonso in Q2 by almost a second uh, and then in the race had a good, bit of a good start uh, and then had that of course had that coming together with uh, Yuki Tsunoda at turn 4 I believe it was. I really feel like Stroll probably should have backed out of that corner, he was the car behind it's not really a traditional overtaking spot. Uh, so we basically just sent it down the inside. I don't think it was really a move that was ever on and obviously it compromised his race. Actually, no, it did not compromise his race uh, at the end, but in terms of pace, but it definitely compromised Yuki Tsunoda's. Uh, and then Stroll's uh, unfortunately forced to retire at the end with a unrelated uh, issue. I think it was the brakes he said in his interview after the race. Uh, number 19. I'm gonna go with Esteban Ocon. Pretty rough uh, race for the French driver. Uh, ended up qualifying, well, he started he qualified 19th. Uh, ended up starting the race from the pit lane. Uh, he was out qualified by his teammate Pierre Gasly by 1.416 seconds. Uh, he had some kind of incident crash related issue uh, at his final run in Q1, which brought out those yellow flags, which of course became a big point of discussion after qualifying, uh, but nonetheless, it really just showed that that gap between himself and Gasly, not representative, but still pretty scruffy qualifying from Ocon. And then in the race, ends up 15th, uh, not behind his teammate, who again was forced to, I believe, start behind him. Uh, and again, pretty anonymous, not a great Grand Prix for Ocon. Uh, number 18, I'm gonna go with uh, Valtteri Bottas. So for Bottas, he, he started the Grand Prix in 16th. Uh, it qualified Joe by about six and a half tenths of a second. But again, similar to Ocon, qualifying gap not very representative as uh, Bottas was given a pretty big toe by his teammate Joe who was forced to start from the back uh, for exceeding his power, number of power unit elements. So again, big help in qualifying there. Didn't really do much uh, for him uh, in terms of grid placement. And then the Grand Prix kind of just the tire strategy that he tried to go on didn't really work and it ended up uh, finishing 16th on the road, the last uh, driver who uh, took the checkered flag. Uh, number 17, I'm gonna go with Daniel Ricciardo. Uh, so Ricciardo, another tough Grand Prix, out qualified by his teammate Yuki Tsunoda by about two tenths of a second. Ended up starting the Grand Prix from 14th on the grid. Uh, and then in the Grand Prix, a bit of an anonymous Grand Prix, didn't really get in involved in many incidents, uh, but ended up coming uh, home 14th on the road, uh, no, 13th on the road. And unfortunately, this would have been a Grand Prix with quite so many drivers, uh, top drivers especially, not getting big points finishes. This would have been a weekend that he would have wanted uh, to potentially get some points and close that gap to his teammate, Yuki Tsunoda. Uh, speaking of his teammate, Yuki Tsunoda, I've decided to uh, put him in 16th. Uh, so for Sonata, a tough Grand Prix, uh, another second race in a row where his race has been ended prematurely because of damage. Uh, qualifying went pretty well, qualified, well started the race 11th. Uh, I know the starting positions, qualifying positions are all mixed up because of uh, Gasly getting disqualified from qualifying and then Hamilton opting to start the race from the back. So uh, qualifying position, starting position is not quite uh, lined up. But yes, uh, for Sonoda, he uh, qualified 11th, out-qualified his teammate Daniel Ricciardo by about two uh, tenths of a second, so good qualifying session there. And again, like I mentioned, got involved in that tangle uh, with Lance Stroll at the start. Didn't think that uh, Sonoda had, could have done really much more. He, of course, could have just left the door wide open, but that, of course, would have compromised him. And of course, he was the driver ahead, so uh, he was the driver who uh, had the right to basically take the racing line. And that's something that we'll talk about in a little bit with another incident that happened during the race. Uh, number 15, I'm gonna go with Zhou Guangyu. So for Zhou, 
Qualifying was a bit of a write-off, like I mentioned. Uh, he tried to help his teammate as much as possible, giving him a slipstream down that long straight. Uh, ended up starting the Grand Prix 17th on the grid because of drivers behind either being disqualified or starting from the pit lane. Uh, but yeah, it'll qualify by 6th, 10th, but again, doesn't really matter because of the circumstances. And in the race, I think had an okay race, ended up finishing 14th on the road, beat his teammate there. So I think not an absolutely awful Grand Prix for Joe. Uh, number 14, number 14, probably his worst Grand Prix of the season uh, in terms of just, you know, start to finish. Uh, and that is going to be Max Verstappen. So for Verstappen, uh, he qualifies six on the grid. Uh, he'll qualify by two tenths of a second by his teammate Sergio Perez. Uh, and even though he was the, that gap was only two second, two tenths of a second, you know Perez in his post qualifying interview was pretty unhappy with the pace and felt he could have been on the front row. And you know if Perez is unhappy with the qualifying uh, and he's qualifying ahead of Verstappen, then it really shows that Verstappen had a pretty poor session all around. Kind of went seems went the wrong way, went a bit too far with the setup. And again, you can ask how much of that is on the driver, how much of that is on the team. And of course, for a driver like Verstappen, uh, you know, who's you know has so much influence within that Red Bull team, you would expect that he would have okayed uh, some of those setup changes himself. Uh, but again, it's one of those things where it's a bit of a 50-50, where you're not really sure how much of it is on the driver, how much of it is on the team. Uh, and then in the Grand Prix, he had a pretty uh, uninspiring race, I would say. Uh, never really looked to have the race pace that Perez did. You know, Perez was able to challenge the front two and looked at points like, you know, if things had gone a little bit differently, he could have perhaps uh, ended up with the win. But for Verstappen, that was definitely not the case, was basically battling George Russell for most of the Grand Prix and then pipped at the end by Lando Norris charging uh, on his medium tires. And without that incident, he would have finished seventh on the road, helped as well by the fact that Hamilton was also having a pretty grand, poor Grand Prix himself. Uh, but yeah, it would have been basically the worst of the drivers who started in that top group. Uh, and yeah, pretty miserable weekend all around for Verstappen, one that he's definitely going to be wanting to forget pretty quickly. Uh, number 13, uh, fellow world champion, I'm going to go with Lewis Hamilton. So for Hamilton, qualifies seventh, out qualified by his teammate uh, George Russell by four tenths of a second, pretty big gap there. Of course, then opts to start from the pit lane. And I, I really felt like I expected Hamilton to make up more progress through the field than he did. He ends up finishing ninth uh, on the road, of course, with those two DNFs of Sainz and Perez. Uh, without that incident on the penultimate lap, he, he would have ended up finishing 11th outside of the points and behind both Williams drivers. So for Hamilton, not a great Grand Prix. I think he definitely made his way through the field. And with the fact that the Mercedes wasn't quite as strong as perhaps the McLaren was, wasn't able to make his way through the field as easily as Lando Norris was, but still pretty tough, tough Grand Prix for Hamilton. I decided to put him in 13th. Uh, number 12, I'm going to go with uh, Pierre Gasly. So for Gasly, uh, I think honestly a pretty decent result, pretty, an underrated drive from him. Uh, and he was originally qualified 13th, of course, disqualified for a fuel flow. Might have had a tiny impact on his pace in qualifying, but realistically with a lot of these technical DNFs, uh, the impact that they have on, on performance is very, very small. It's just the nature of the FIE's rules where it's very much black and white. If you're over a certain line, over a certain limit, uh, then you are just disqualified. Uh, but but, but Gasly, you know, qualifying went pretty well, ended up starting 18th, uh, you know, and out-qualified his teammate uh, Esteban Ocon by a pretty significant margin. And then in the race, uh, got moved his way through the field, ended up having some good battles, ultimately finished 12th on the road. And perhaps without that disqualification from qualifying, if he had started further up, perhaps he you know ends up in a points paying position. But you know, all in all, I think a pretty solid result for Gasly. Uh, number 11. Uh, number 11, I'm gonna go with uh, Carlos Sainz. Uh, so for Sainz, out qualified by his teammate, uh, Charles Leclerc by about four and a half tenths of a second. Pretty big margin there, but of course, you know, we know Charles Leclerc is a master of Baku. Uh, so, you know, being out qualified by Leclerc isn't really that big of a deal. Still ended, started third on the grid, which is a pretty good starting position. Didn't, uh, lost, uh, lost a position to Perez at the start, and then kind of, through most of the Grand Prix, was just kind of doing his own race. But towards the end, of course, got into that battle. And of course, he had that big incident with, uh, 
uh, Sergio Perez as well. And I, I, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read what the FI the stewards said after that crash. So, uh, just because I, I think it's interesting. So, the stewards checked the driving line of the drivers on previous laps. Signs was was on or close to his normal racing line, which forms a slight angle away from the right hand wall. From the exit to the point of contact, he moved approximately one car width further away from the wall. Perez moved approximately half a car width further away from the wall. Uh, being more parallel to the right hand wall uh being yeah further away from the same wall being more parallel to the right hand wall it was thus apparent that while ahead and having the right to drive his line signs did move slightly towards a car that he had limited vision of at the same time there was nothing unusual about Perez's line but he could have done more to avoid the car that he had a better view of in conclusion the stewards deemed this to be a racing incident with neither driver being predominantly at fault and taking no further action so uh, interesting view that the stewards have of it. I kind of agree with what they're, where they're coming from. So for signs, I've really felt like for this crash, he, both both him and Perez were trying to basically stay directly behind Charles Leclerc ahead so that they could both get the slipstream and so that they could both basically have the best chance of being able to come out ahead in going into turn three. Of course, with both drivers basically trying to be in the exact same space right behind Charles Leclerc, they both end up inevitably crashing. Now, Sainz is the driver ahead, so again, he has the right to the racing to the racing line, and because, as the stewards noted, he has that right to basically uh, try to take his line. That being said, for Sainz, he should have known that Perez was going to be on the inside, and that uh, he he that Perez is you know Perez couldn't just disappear. Um, from that position. That being said, you know, Paris did have a lot of space on that inside, but again, similar position to uh, signs. There was, in theory, a car's width on the other side, so again, why does Paris need to move over? Uh, so I think it's one of those 50 50 ones where both drivers, I think, take a little bit of a have to take a little bit of blame for it. And again, in my power ranking, both drivers do take up a bit of a hit. For signs, it was an okay weekend again, you know. Being, being beaten by his teammate again he was always going to most likely finish behind his teammate but for Paris this was a pretty good weekend uh, one of his best arguably his best race this season but you know both of them I think take a hit in my power rankings so I thought um, yeah it would be interesting just an important context to you know read that stewards decision so uh, moving into the top 10 we go so uh, number 10 I'm going to go with Oliver Behrman so for Behrman Qualifying went quite well, had a bit of a scare, again, got, almost got knocked down in Q1, but gets into Q2, out-qualifies his teammate uh, Nico Hulkenberg by about two and a half tenths of a second. So qualifying goes very, very well. Uh, in the race, struggles a little bit with tire wear, uh, ends up behind his teammate, ends up behind both Williams. Uh, and But because of um, basically a bit of misfortune on his teammate Hulkenberg's part, Hulkenberg basically runs over a bunch of debris from signs in Paris's crash. I don't know what exactly happened. If it just if if it broke the car, if it just there was a miscommunication with race control as well because it was green flags right after the crash. Uh, but basically, Behrman opportunistically takes advantage of that, gets ahead of his teammate, and gets that final point. So, for basically ninety percent, ninety five percent of the Grand Prix, Hulkenberg was looking. I think was the better driver, uh, and again probably what should have gotten that one point but Behrman op opportunistic gets that one point still not that being said really good weekend for Behrman I think just further proof of why he deserves to be an F1 next year regardless of his pretty poor results in Formula 2. Uh, number 9 oh, I'm gonna go with uh, Franco Colapinto so for Colapinto uh, starts Grand Prix 8th out qualified his teammate Alex Albon by three, about three and a half tenths of a second. Uh, but of course, you know, there's a bit of an asterisk there with the fact that uh, Albon was not able to set lap time at the end of Q3 because of the fact that he had a fan stuck in his car. So again, a little bit of context there that explains why he was able, Carl Pinto was able to out qualify Albon. Pace in the race I thought was honestly pretty good, kept it clean, kept it out of the wall. Uh, and I think better better pace overall than uh, Behrman and I think a little bit about the same little bit maybe a little bit worse than uh, Hulkenberg as well but that's ultimately why I decided to put 
Cole Pinto ahead of Behrman. I think you could arguably put them in any other order. But the fact is that you basically have two drivers, both of them in their second ever Grand Prix, both of them being in the top 10 on a pretty difficult track. I think, you know, highlights, you know, how good, how well prepared young drivers are these days, or at least most of them are. Um, number eight. Uh, number eight, I'm going to go with Nico Hulkenberg. So for Hulkenberg, uh, started 12th, out-qualified by Behrman. Not sure if he had some kind of issue that led to him being out-qualified. But in the race, a uh, very, very strong pace. Was arguably, was looking to basically be the third kind of best of the rest driver. Ultimately, wasn't able to end up in that position uh, because of, you know, him going through debris uh, from after the crash between Perez and Sainz. And then dropped a couple of positions and dropped him well out dropped him outside of the points. So I think a bit unfortunate for him, otherwise he easily could have ended up in P9. Would have been a nice couple points for him uh, and would have been a really good result for uh, himself and the team as well. I think I don't take anything away from that though. Uh, I think you know he drove a very, very good race on a track that he's traditionally not great at. So I, that's why I decided to put him slightly ahead of Cole Pinto and Barrowman. Uh, number seven. Sergio Perez. So for Perez, I think this is a weekend of what really could have been. Um, qualifying went very well, uh, despite what he said. He out-qualified his teammate uh, Max Verstappen by two tenths of a second. First time that he's out-qualified uh, his teammate on pace uh, without any kind of external issues uh, in basically you know, over two years. And again, at the same track, Baku. So again, this is for Perez, the trick is going to be trying, can he replicate his form here at other tracks? And that's definitely I think a question that he's going to have to try to answer in the coming races. In the Grand Prix, very, very strong pace, was able to basically move his way up, uh, get past sign to the start, and then in the race was able to kind of be part of that lead pack uh, with Leclerc and Piastri for the second stint. Uh, and then, yeah, just very really unfortunate the incident with signs. I think for Perez, you, you can see watching his onboard that you can see signs starting to drift over. And so there was a moment where Paris could have reacted and started and drifted over as well to avoid the contact. Um, uh, you know, I understand what he was trying to do. He was trying to stay in the slipstream of Leclerc. Uh, but again, I think he probably, you know, seeing that, seeing the incident, how things unfold, were unfolding in front of him, he should have been able to react and say, oh yeah, okay, signs is moving, is drifting over to the left. I have to do this too, otherwise we're gonna have a crash. Um, and yeah, unfortunately comes away with no points in a weekend where he could have easily gotten 12 points, 15 points, could have gotten his first podium since China. And now he's gonna have to kind of try to take as many positives away from this weekend as he can. You know, the fact that he had very, very strong pace in, in, in the race, decent qualifying as well, and try to bring that forward to the next Grand Prix that we go to. Okay, so number six, um, I'm going to go with Lando Norris. So for Norris, of course, a uh, bit unlucky in qualifying with the uh, yellow flag, which meant that he was unable to, uh, to get into Q2. Uh, he, of course, made that mistake right beforehand uh, the in the you know the final real corner, where he basically went on the curb, lost you know a couple tenths of a second. Uh, I think I, I looked at some analysis of this, and basically, even if if the yellow flag, if, even without that mistake because of the yellow flags, he would have lost too much time and would have you know, still been knocked out. I think for Norris though, the reality is that uh, if he, I think the McLaren is strong enough that on most tracks, they should be able to uh, only have to do one lap in Q1. So I think for Norris, if his first lap had been a little bit stronger, uh, if he had been a little bit further ahead with that one lap, that first lap, he doesn't have to put himself in a situation where he's potentially getting knocked out uh, in Q1. Uh, the race pace was very, very strong, cut his way through the field with relative ease, got himself all the way up to fourth. That would have been six on the road without the crash. But again, critically for him, he ended up ahead of Verstappen uh, and got uh, three more points in the bag, chipping three more points away out of Verstappen's lead. Uh, now into the top five we go. Number five, I'm gonna go with uh, Alex Albon. So for Albon, very, very strong Grand Prix. Uh, could have been a little bit better in qualifying without that fan incident. Maybe perhaps out qualifies uh, Alonso, but regardless, without that, still you know a top ten start for Albon. Uh, and then in the race, a uh, very very strong pace on the alternative strategy. Actually lost quite a bit of time uh, with 
the fact that he basically got caught up racing the leaders actually uh, when because he hadn't stopped yet. Uh, and then when he came out, much fresher tires was able to make cut his way through those drivers who were ahead of him. Uh, but you know, I think all in all, really was always a strong weekend for Albon. Uh, number four, I'm gonna go with George Russell. Uh, so for Russell, pretty decent Grand Prix. He qualifies his teammate Lewis Hamilton by four tenths of a second uh, in the race. I think decent pace had a couple good battles with Verstappen. Uh, ultimately, beat uh, beat the Dutchman out. Uh, to end, end up ahead of him and then picked up the pieces of that final spot on the podium after uh, Perez and Sainz both crashed out. So again, decent Grand Prix I felt for Russell. Now, uh, moving into the top three, uh, number three, I'm going to go with uh, Fernando Alonso. So for Alonso, uh, qualifying went very, very well. I qualified Stroll by almost a second. Uh, excellent lap in Q2, not able to do quite as well in Q3, but still nonetheless best of the rest. Uh, and then in the race, just kind of stolidly did his own race, was a bit off the leader's pace, but was kind of, it felt ahead of the Williams, ahead of the Hasses. Uh, and I think benefited quite a bit from the fact that, you know, you had Hamilton starting at the back, and then again, you had Perez and uh, Sainz crashing out, which meant that his points haul, which would have been, probably would have been a ninth place finish if Hamilton does himself from the back, ends up being a sixth place, and he ends up getting eight points, which is a pretty, uh, tidy haul of points for him. Now into the top two we go, and I think number two, uh, I'm gonna put Charles Leclerc, which of course means number one is Oscar Piastri. So uh, Piastri, Piastri and Leclerc, I think very, very close in terms of performance. I think you could arguably put them in, swap them around. Uh, Leclerc, exceptional performance on, on Saturday uh, with his four straight pull lap in Azerbaijan, but I did feel that Leclerc, unfortunately, uh, I felt like he probably could have defended a little bit harder uh, that move from Piastri. It came from so far back and it was basically just that one chance that Piastri had while Leclerc's tires were still a little bit cool. Um, and then again, likewise, I think probably could have been a little bit more aggressive uh, trying to overtake him. But I think ultimately at the end of the, end of the day, I think uh, in terms of race pace on most tracks, the McLaren is the better car. And for Piastri, I think very, very well executed Grand Prix. Qualifying pretty good as well. Of course, not pole position. Pole position would have been perfect. Uh, basically like a perfect weekend for him, but for Piastri, still a very, very good Grand Prix. Uh, did an exceptional job defending from Leclerc after he made that really ambitious overtake. And I think did a really good job of managing the tires as in the last five or six laps or so, he was basically able to pull away from Leclerc. So he did a really good job of both defending and managing the tires so that he had enough tires at the end of the Grand Prix uh, and was able to kind of stay away from the chaos that unfolded in those last, uh, that penultimate lap between the two Ferraris and Paris. So there you go, this is my power rankings for the 2024 Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Uh, pretty good Grand Prix and again, now unfortunately we have to wait another two weeks uh, until our next Grand Prix in Singapore. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.